Hello and welcome everybody. This is the ET Newsroom and it is the 15th of, gosh, February. How did we get there already? And it's 2021. And I have a, a wonderful, wonderful day today for you, a wonderful hour. And this is with a lovely man called John G. Sutton and a lady I know quite well called Pat Byrne. And you may say, well, what's this to do with Joanne? Well, I've taken a slight tangent of my interest, which is the ET newsroom. Somebody will know, or some of you will know me for all of that kind of work, linking with ETs, etc. Well, I'm also interested in animals and the psychic um, higher consciousness world. And today, John and Pat are going to share some of their stories about those experiences. So we're going to start with John. And I'm delighted to invite John on this show, particularly because he also was a guest on one or two shows that I did about my book, 44, which featured Bill Brooks, a colleague of his way back in 1968, when they both had an amazing paranormal event in the barracks. So, John, actually, Great. maybe it would be quite interesting just to start with that little story before we go on to your wonderful book, Psychic Pets, which I've just ordered, by the way. All right, oh, so you've got a copy of my world best-selling title, Psychic Pets. You know what? It's in the post, and it really is. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Okay, so you want me to tell you about... Uh, a little bit about what happened to me, yeah. I think that would be really interesting because right, well, uh, uh, that's how we connected. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we go back to the year 1968, which is just a little while ago. I was a soldier serving in the British Army of the Rhine in Germany. And uh, what happened there was I was in the ballot rooms and uh, we got a Ouija board and uh, uh, at the time, I was fairly innocent, and I never thought anything about this. We'd just have a game with it, you know, play with it. And uh, I took it into uh, one of my colleagues' rooms, we slept just down the back room block from me, and we were messing with the Ouija board. And uh, the guy in the corner, who wasn't uh, taking part in this, uh, he, he, he says to us, this is a joke, you know, you're just having a laugh. And the Ouija board spelled out, this man will will not, he will suffer, he's going to, I said, this, this, you've annoyed the Ouija board, you know. Anyway, we, we just packed it in and went to bed. Anyway, the next morning, uh, he came into my room at about eight o'clock. He said, you're a maniac, you know. I said, well, what's happened? You know, I mean, it was innocent enough. You know, we went to bed about 11 o'clock. So he said, come and look what you've done to my room. I had not done anything. I've been in bed, you know. And I went to his room and it was an absolute, as if somebody had torn in there with a tornado. The beds were upside down. Metal lockers, big military issue metal lockers were bent right over. And his room was an absolute mess. He said, I've been hiding under the mattress in the corner all night. He said, how did you do this? Well, it wasn't me. And from that night on, we kept hearing, well, I could hear it, like loud booming noises echoing all through the barrack block. And I'd go open my bedroom, the door, and, my bed, well, and there was nothing there. Nobody else could hear it. I could hear it. And about uh, a week or so later, it would be about three o'clock in the morning and I heard the footstep, footsteps walking across the room and it was pitch black and I thought, oh no, that Welshman's going to pee in the corner again, you know, because <laughs> soldiers have a tendency to get, uh, and this guy's, his habit was to urinate in the corner, which was a bad thing. Anyway, I looked out and it wasn't him, it was an enormous apparition standing at the foot of my bed and it must have been about seven or eight foot tall it was ginormous i couldn't quite see what it was but it looked to have half its head missing it was it, it absolutely terrified me so much that i, I cowered under the bed covers and I, I i never did find out what it was but the guy the guy in the bed opposite me yeah, was bill brooks and uh he saw it too now if two people see the same thing that's good enough evidence yeah. to get you convicted in court yeah he, he didn't know what it was either 
And interestingly enough, because this is in, we didn't say where this was. This was, was this Paderborn or was this Senilaga? It was in the area of Paderborn. It was a place called Senilaga and yeah. it was, a, a, the barracks was called Dempsey Barracks. Oh yeah, of course. And, and we were soldiers working on the Honest John missile, which was a, a nuclear weapon. And what was interesting, John, that when I was doing research for the book uh, 44, which is based on the next soldier's true story of lifelong encounters involving alien abduction, we had a call from a young man, a young military man, only in his 20s, who was waiting to get out of the army. And he was really uh, freaked out because he was in Paderborn and he had seen an apparition of um, a reptilian, is what he called it. And he wasn't really... Uh, schooled or interested or anything to do with this field but that absolutely terrified him and when he heard some of the interviews that I'd done with Bill uh, and it was the same area he called them he said the amazing thing was this whatever it was was semi-transparent and I could see my lockers through him and um, the other side of the room and he said the thing is that um, I, I was so shocked and stunned and this was a, a quite a, a tall being definitely reptilian not not anybody in kind of some weird um, you know dress or anything because it was transparent but he said they looked eyes on one another and they both looked as surprised as each other and then he disappeared and that made me go and research if there was anything else in Paderborn that had experiences for example of the reptilian uh, kind of thing and there's uh, a Paderborn paranormal group and one of the things they reported was that quite a lot of military people have reported seeing reptilians around the base. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Very interesting. I have another colleague who is also serving uh, at, at uh, Paderborn in that area at the time. And uh, it, it, John Brown, his name is. And uh, I was telling him this story, well, 50 years later, because I hadn't seen him for a long time. And he says, it's strangely enough, he said, I saw the same thing in the same barrack block, but at a different time. So the barrack block was obviously haunted. Yeah. And what, what you saw, John, do you think that was human looking? Or could you not tell? <laughs> it was just too big to be human. I mean, it could have been, uh, I don't know, what's his name? Tyson Fury. <laughs> <laughs> And is, is it is he human <laughs> yeah no it was that kind of size it was just absolutely enormous it, yeah. it, it didn't appear human right very 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 interesting well i just thought that was an interesting interlude into yeah. the animal side <laughs> and well, um, yeah. just before we we bring pat in i just want to know what it was that spurred you on to write your book psychic pets and please tell us a little bit about what it what that's about is it a collection of stories is it your own experiences do tell mm -hmm. well psychic pets i was the i was for 27 years the feature editor of the british journal of spiritualism called psychic world and i was the feature editor and i used to inter interview many people and write articles about this and i started to get a series of letters from people telling me about their adventures with their pets, you know, that their pets had uh, interacted with them in a, in a paranormal manner. Uh, so I had, a, I had a literary agent and I sent the idea to my literary agent who parceled it up and sent it to uh, Bloomsbury. And at the time, the managing editor of Bloomsbury was a man called Barry Cunningham. And uh, Barry Cunningham invited me to go to London to meet him said I'm interested in this let's have a talk uh, and when I got there we had a discussion about this and uh, he introduced me to one or two people and one of them being JK Rowling who okay. was uh, in the same office and uh, he said yes I'm very interested in, in in the idea of you doing a book he said we'll call uh, he said now I'm going to introduce you to the lady who will be editing your work and it was a lady called Ingrid von Essen and she was a, a, a tutor or a professor of English literature at Cambridge University. And she did this in her spare time. And she said to me, she said, Mr. Sutton, if you cannot write, then I will tell you that and it will not be published. <laughs> she was a, a real charming lady, you know. Anyway, I, I set about writing it and here it is, Psychic Pets. 
Yeah. And it, indeed, it was published. It won uh, the Times Children's Book of the Year in 1977. Oh, great. And, uh, uh, they gave me a, a publicity agent. Seriously, oh. I mean, the, the publicity agent got me on this morning with Richard and Judy, flew me to America, put me on with Walt Disney and uh, New York with uh, was it Fox TV? And interesting story about that. I was doing a series of interviews for the children's news channel, and. Uh, he said, we want to interview you uh, in, a, in the open air. So they took me to Central Park in, in New York. I didn't think anything about it, you know, but they had cameras and lights. And of course, we get into the filming and, and they said they were going to do one or two interviews. They did eight 15 minute interviews with me. And by the time we'd finished, we'd attracted a massive great crowd. They obviously thought that uh, this was some kind of movie being made. And it, it was just me <laughs> giving them an interview. And the funny thing was the, the daughter of the director, the, the lady directing the actual show, uh, brought me her uh, autograph book. Said, would you sign my autograph for me? Uh, I said, yeah, I'll sign it for you. I signed it. And the guy who'd signed on the page before me, was Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so somebody somewhere has got an autograph book with my name in alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger. They'll be saying, who the hell's this? <laughs> <laughs> so John, perhaps you could just share again, uh, just before I bring Pat in, maybe one of the stories that stands out um, primarily to you if there's is just oh there's a story yeah i mean i don't forget i mean uh, i'm i'm a professional psychic you can look me up on psychicworld.net uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i had a pet a little scotty dog and the scotty dog followed me everywhere it was a little bit antisocial but uh, it followed me everywhere and uh, we had the dog for about 12 years and eventually it came time for the for the dog to go and a uh, strange story that when the dog, we had to get the vet to put the dog down. And uh, I said to my wife, you, you better go and dig a grave. You know, we'll bury the dog in the back garden. So she went out and dug the grave and uh, she said, you better come out. There's a, an injured bird on, on, the, on, on the outside of the garden. So I went out and there wasn't an injured bird. There was a blackbird. And the blackbird was sitting right at the edge of the hole in the ground that my wife had dug for the body of the dog yeah and the and the this is a wild bird a blackbird and it stayed there until we put the body of the dog into the grave and this we were only like two or three feet away from it and we covered the uh, i said a few words over the dog of course my dear old friend and uh, covered the dog up and when he'd done that the bird flew straight up into the air and disappeared completely Absolutely, I believe. I believe that the dog, that the dog's spirit, was taken from this world into the next world by that bird. And the strange thing is, about five years after this, I was sat here, and my wife said, "Look at the mess your hair is. Get it cut." I said, "There's nothing wrong with my hair." Well, you can see it's a mess, you know. But she said, "I'm going to take a photograph of this and show you exactly what a mess your hair is. Let me show you that photograph." I've got it. I've got it here. Yeah. Great. Here we are. If you can see this. Uh, yeah, if there's a lot of light on the image, John. So it's, oh, now you see, I can see that as the, in the thumbnail really easily. It is undoubtedly a little dog. Can you see that, Pat? Not quite, no. Oh, I can see it. Absolutely. It's really interesting. I didn't oh, see yes, it, I John. Can now. Yeah, I can. yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, it's see that. Yeah, once yeah. I got it, it was as clear see that? as day. Yeah. The um, dog. Um, yeah, sorry, John. The, do the dog materialized in my hair. I, I think well, it's amazing. I, I, mm. I really do, because once I saw it, I couldn't, I couldn't unsee it. Uh, and, you, you know, people say, it. oh, you can see this, you can see that. But, I, you know, and I have trouble with that. I mean, only trouble that I can't see. <laughs> I can definitely see that. So that's interesting. So now, Pat, um, I'd love to you to come in and just tell us a little bit about what an animal communicator does for, for people who maybe aren't so familiar. 
Well, it's quite wide ranging um, because people will come to me for various issues that they're having with their animals. Um, and it could be anything from they're concerned about when they might have to have an animal put to sleep. You know, getting a timing of that is quite difficult for some. Some come with behavioural issues, uh, particularly if they've taken on rescue animals. Uh, some are still suffering intense grief from the loss of an animal. So it's more about the human than it is about the animal. But we'll come to that later. Um, sometimes some, uh, there's a bit of training involved, can be tra actual training involved. Um, I'll give you an instance. I had a, uh, an animal that uh, a woman rang me up and she was in a terrible state. And she'd taken on a husky from uh, dog rescue. And this husky had been in the... I think been in the dog rescue for a couple of years in a pen, in a kennel. So it was quite frustrated, but highly, highly intelligent animal. And he actually managed one night to unlock all the doors of the kennels. He got out of his own kennel and set all the dogs free. <laughs> Luckily in a compound, but, you know, it was pretty chaotic. Anyway, this woman took him on and... Um, a lovely, gentle soul, um, but he kept running off. I mean, you know, huskies are born to run, aren't they? Yeah. And um, she rang me, and what she had done the previous week was to, in her frustration and not know how to cope, had said to him, if you carry on like this, because he was running across the field, kind of disappearing out of sight, she had spent hours trying to recall him. She said, if you carry on like this, I'm going to have to ring the dog's trust and you're going to have to go back. Well, within two hours, he chewed the phone up so she couldn't make the call <laughs> or what he thought couldn't make the call. So that was another issue that we dealt with. And when I was able to explain to him the problems it was causing for, you know, the human, on, gave him the human perspective that he might run out in the road and kill somebody, you know, all these things that can go wrong when dogs go she said, well, what can I do? So I said, well, we'll, we'll set out a, a training program for him um, or a, a suggestion. Once he got the hang of what was wrong with his behavior, rather than him just using his instinct, which is perfectly natural, obviously. Once I had explained that to him, I asked him, but when she took him for a walk at this start stage, she was resistant. She was um only keeping him on a lead, which was not really working because he really needed the exercise. So I said, well, when you let him off, you must ask him to maintain eye contact with you. So you mustn't, he mustn't go outside of your vision. And he did it. Wonderful. And, uh, and uh, it took a bit of time, you know, it wasn't instant. And he was rewarded for doing it. But being so intelligent, he got it very quickly. So people come with various issues i mean well another lady came to me because uh her dog was in very sick and the vet had, had suggested that he was put down that weekend and uh, she had a very spiritual very close relationship um and i was able to talk to him and he was able to confirm that it was his time to go and he went another step further and even told her where he wanted to be buried it's it's really that relationship is about uh, giving a bridge between the owner guardian back to the animal. And that's yeah. what it does. On, on it can be any issue, any issue that, you, that we might have in life as humans. Animals will have the same issues because they think and feel emotions just like we do. Yes, I, I think it's uh, really important for people to be made aware of the, the animal, um, you know, not only instinct, but their feelings. That, and a case in point is that a friend of mine contacted me recently, recently saying her lovely doggy, who we both know, Pat, um, was uh, causing a lot of ruckus because the family where he goes and visits quite frequently has got a new cat and he was not OK with that. And she sent me a little, a little video of a, an interaction with him and the cat. And uh, he was just barking like mad. And I could see, I could read it. And maybe I'll have to show you that, Pat, sometime. It looked yeah, like yeah. he was trying to he was trying to alert them that there was an intruder, and that yeah. you know he he nobody of course thought to tell him that this was a new family member, and I know that people would say oh you, you know you're nuts, <laughs> but actually if you take a step or two to include the 
the creature, I know if you say that uh, we are all one and uh, everything is connected, then that makes perfect sense to, to do that and include them. And, and I said, and you might want to try a bit of rescue remedy, which is a great thing for just calming and helping with shock because it, it is a shock when you've had your life one way and then suddenly there's another being in there. It's like a new baby in the family. Sometimes the other members of the family, the smaller ones, don't understand for quite a long time. And it takes a little bit of a, uh, you know, time for them to acclimatize to uh, the new situation. And it's no different for, for a dog, but people, or, or any animal actually, but people often don't think about that. And I think this is part of our own human evolutionary process of including that we are all connected and so are they. <laughs> I don't know what you I'm, think about that. No. Sorry, Pat, go on. No, it just occurred to me, and uh, um, they don't actually, people don't, they'll talk to their animals like, like in general terms, you know, you lovely boy, whatever, but in terms of specifics, when animals, and particularly dogs, because, you know, they're more tuned into our daily routines, but I used to say to people, talk to your dog, you wouldn't just walk out of your house and leave your partner and not say something like, just pop into the shop, I'll be about half an hour or whatever. Your dog needs to know when you disappear at the door, where are you going? When are you coming back? Particularly if their routine, and dogs have a, quite a good routine with, with humans, is disrupted in any way, whether it's just that or another. But as soon as you explain where you're going, I mean, I had a dog and I used to, uh, he had separation anxiety when I first had him. And I used to always say, I'm going shopping, I'll be half an hour and I'm bringing you back a treat. And, you know, that was all through his life that he knew that I would be back within an hour. And he'd settle down and go to sleep. And he probably would have only begun to get anxious because they've got a good sense of timing as well. Yeah. It's a pretty fundamental thing that they don't talk. If they've got an impending change coming in their family structure, they don't advise the animals they've currently got and say, look, it's okay, but this is going to be happening next week. You'll be safe. Life will go on as whatever you have to do just to give them that information. And then they're included. Even yeah. tell them when they're going to the vets, not cats, because they'll shoot <laughs> off someone. They know <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Most but, of them know. But. but I think also dogs have a very good, um, a very good insight into their humans, um, uh, you know, owners' uh, situation. Yeah. And I think oh, yeah. you might ha have um, experienced that before where the person comes for an animal communication only to receive from the animal uh, a dissertation almost about their, their, their owner's current state of yeah. mind, state of affairs, yeah. and what the real issue is for the person. And actually it's not a dog issue though sometimes from reports that I've heard, the animal's condition will clear up once the human owner has addressed their own, which is often reflected in the animal. It is, and the reflection is often quite specific. So say if the person's got a skin problem or got a problem that hasn't gone away, then we're talking about the physical, the animal might pick that up and, and display that and, and highlight it. So that, but on a deeper level, they I have had particularly more recently in the last year, more animals say to me, you know, she's not following her spiritual path. Oh, really? <laughs> and she's not she's not really addressing this, this and this. And I, I've been sort of amazed, really. And, you know, she's worrying too much about that as well. She doesn't need to worry about that because they are the silent witness in our lives. Yeah, they witness everything we do. It's like having a camera, isn't it? Yeah. Their eyes follow us all the time. They're noting it all at an energetic level. They're feeling. They're feeling what we're feeling. Yeah. You know, I know if I start rushing around, my cats start rushing around and and start acting silly. It, <laughs> it's they're, so, they're such good reflectors that it's important that we are attuned to that. Yeah. But they, a lot of them are spiritual facilitators as well, particularly yeah, I think, for I think that's a really who important. are quite awakened, you know, um, owners who are quite awakened and are aware of that. And if they're open to hearing that, it's great because it's very positive for, for both sides. Yeah. 
what do you what are your feelings about that john have you had um you know any any interaction or awareness of animals that you know bring in that element to where they are reflecting their owners issues yeah i mean i i had a bulldog it was a great great friend of mine it was called grumbles <laughs> and uh seriously and uh my friend was diagnosed with cancer and uh it, the, the diagnosis was quite bad and I was quite upset to hear this and uh, believe it or not grumbles came up she was usually snoring for Great Britain in the corner of the room it seems like uh, she came up and put her head on my knee you know and looked up at me as if to say don't worry it's going to be all right you know um, uh, and so there was a telepathic I believe that is it is a telepathic communication because dogs obviously do not speak but they do speak to us uh, telepathically so I always find that if you're going to say something to your dog visualize it at the same time that you're saying it so if you're talking yeah. about you're going to feed the dog say you're going to get you get your food now and visualize giving the dog the food and the, and it develops that telepathic communication between you yeah, I did some uh, work, well, briefly with uh, a man called Professor Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, wonderful uh, when I, man! Yeah, when I was researching psychic pets, and uh, he was doing tests on how animals can recognise when their owners are coming home. Mm. You know, and the way he did the test was setting cameras up and watching the pet how it reacted as their owner got closer to the house. And they found that some pets actually, when the, when the owner was about a mile away, the pets would, if they were asleep, they would wake up and run to the door or jump and look through the window. Yeah. When, the, when their owner was absolutely nowhere in sight, but they were heading in that direction. Now, uh, my understanding of this is that we all have an energy field that surrounds us and that and the, the pets and our pets dogs and cats are sensitive to our personal energy field so that as we start to enter into their energy field they they can pick this up and therefore they interact and you'll notice i mean try it with the your, your pet anybody who's watching this try it with your pet Take your pet out in the car, drive anywhere you're going, and notice that when you get within, say, half a mile or a mile of your home, if your pet's asleep on the back seat, it'll wake up. How does the, how does the, they won't be able to see where they're going, but they'll still wake up and they'll start to interact and they're ready to come home. They themselves know where they're going. It's like a, a homing instinct. Do yeah. you have any thoughts on that, Pat? I do. In fact, I've got a little story to tell you about my uh, dog who I used to take into work. The same dog I was talking about earlier because of his separation anxiety. Um, and I was going to the same place, Basingstoke, where my work was, but I was coming in from a different direction because we'd just moved house. So we came up to the same roundabout from a different direction. And as we approached this roundabout, he always, when we came from the other direction, he used to sit up because he knew we were like minutes from parking and going into the office. So we came in from a completely different direction. He did exactly the same thing. So he recognized, as you said, the energetic distance. It didn't matter which where, where he came. There were four exits off this great big roundabout. But I was, I was I remember seeing him sit up and go, oh, OK, right, I've got it, got it now, getting ready to get out of the car. And I had another cat who was a, a semi-feral cat who lived with me. And um, she was very highly intelligent. And I had a job at that time where I used to, my hours used to change quite a bit. So I could get home at 5, 5.36. But if she was in the house, she was always at the window whatever time I arrived, without fail. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I've had a, a lovely experience with my beautiful old Battersea special doggy from many years ago. And I know when I, and he was a very, I brought him up as a really independent doggy, but he was really loving, really chilled out, 
he was one of those Heinz variety mixers, maybe a bit of a collie in him. And he was very sensitive. Um, and when one day I was really upset, I can't remember what it was about, and I was just sitting in the middle of the floor and I was just, you know, having a little bit of a sob. And he walked up to me, sat right in front of me, and he'd never done this before, and put his shoulder, uh, uh, head on my shoulder. And it was, it was just amazing. I mean, that he was so incredibly tuned in and compassionate. I thought that was yeah. just uh, astonishing. The cats didn't really see seem to have the same kind of uh, interaction but the doggies definitely it was beautiful <laughs> there have been stories of, um, of animals cats or dogs going to a specific part of a human body like there was a story of a cat that kept patting this woman's breast and kept patting it patting it day you know every day and when she got it checked out she actually did breast cancer all right yeah. So, you know, I, after, as John was saying, at an energetic level, the, the amount of information they can pick up, whether it's direction or whether it's actual imbalance in, in our energy systems, I mean, they're amazing, really. Well, they are. They're, amazing, they're much more aware than we are, as we yes. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John, I was just wondering if you could share with us something, some other story from your book psychic pets that may be uh, a particularly interesting one. yeah well, as i said i i did research i mean these are not stories that i've made up these are actual research stories from around the world uh, and there's one story of, involving uh, a dog in australia and they had a, a very good friend two dogs were friends you know and uh, eventually the family moved away probably about 50 miles away into another part of australia and uh, the dog that moved was actually became very ill and it was about to move between the dimensions i don't believe in death i believe that there are a number of dimensions and that this is a material dimension yeah. that we're here for a short period of time and that eventually we move our spirits move into the next dimension and this dog was at the point where it was going to pass and the house that they lived in had a fence around it because it was in the middle of the uh, the bush in australia and they had to build a, a wall like a, a wire fence around it to keep the kangaroos and whatever else it was the wild animals out so there was no way in, but at about four o'clock in the morning, the owner of the house heard the barking of this dog and went out and there in the compound next to the dying dog was its friend from 50 miles away. No How had that dog transported itself? It was, it was almost as if it, like it, it had been teleported through time yeah. and space to be beside. And that's where it stayed until its friend died. Oh, now yeah. that that was, I researched that story with the lady, and she was absolutely certain. And I spoke to the owner of the other dog, and she said, "Yes, that dog just disappeared. Wow! Well, and appeared fifty miles away in this compound next yeah. to its friend." Yeah. It's now that beautiful. is an amazing story, isn't it? It it certainly is. I mean, we're talking about pets, and um, the pets. Um, I mean, animals. It's just animals in general as well. I mean. Pat, you know that you've dealt with horses uh, and that, you know, everybody I think is in agreement of how psychic those guys are and, and other creatures like, you know, wolves, bears, pigs, super intelligent, super aware. And uh, I've watched quite a lot of those beautiful videos where you see the animals, what turkeys, you know, birds, even fish, uh, crocodiles even, where people have bonded through either a rescue or a trauma, whatever. And there is a complete um, uh, understanding between the parties, whoever they are, whatever the creature is, which, you know, sometimes may have been a dangerous creature to anybody else or whatever, but there is this most incredible, unbreakable bond. It's absolutely beautiful. I remember the story of the, the guy known as the Elephant Whisperer. When he died, yeah. I mean, the whole herd of elephants and more came. I mean, oh, honestly, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way. It's you know, heartwarming, heartbreaking. You know, I know, you, I know, we can say there's there's just dimensions, but boy, do we miss the physicality of you know the little doggy? I miss mine. 
There is, a book, there is a book that you, you should read. You really should get this book if you're interested in the in the power and the, uh, of paranormal animals. It's called When Elephants Weep. Oh. Have, you, have you ever read that book? No. It is it is absolutely amazing. And elephants have got emotions. Oh, yes. Yeah, and, and, and all animals have emotions. That's why and, and one of the books that I wrote was called Animals Make You Feel Better. That's another one of my books that was published by Element Penguin. And my aim in that book was anybody who read that book would never be able to mistreat an animal again because it's about the emotions of animals and the interaction and the bonding, as you mentioned there, the bonding between humans and the animal kingdom. Because basically we're animals, we've got words, they have too, but we just can't at this point understand them. Pat, you obviously can, but do you believe that you are doing so telepathically or are you doing so through psychic powers? Well, I don't really know, to be honest. I sort of tend not to um, analyse those things too much because my my journey has given me lots of interesting experiences. I think telepathic at one point, but I think it's gone more into psychic more recently. Very good. So, when you speak to the when you speak to the animals, yes. are you are you speaking telepathically as well as as actually verbally? Yes. Yes, I mean, I, I, I can, I, I speak to them through my head, if you like. So I was, I, I, when I talk to an animal for the first time, I always ask their permission and ask them if they're willing to have this conversation because they must be willing as well. And then you start to get, but what I do is I do, I do this distantly from a photograph and I get one with good eye contact so I can connect with their soul essence and their... Yeah. Their, their energy field and you can pick up an awful lot just from that that's even before I've attempted to have a conversation with them I usually, do that, I usually do that the day before to, to merge in with their field and get the feeling of what they're feeling and Excellent. then yeah that, 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 that will work, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I did a show for uh, Fox TV in uh, New York, and I, I didn't realise I was going to do this, but they put me live on television taking calls from around America. And the yeah. first call that came in was from Texas, and this lady said, there's something wrong with my dog. It will not sleep at night. So I said, well, would you put your dog on the telephone? <laughs> so seriously, they did put the dog on the telephone, and I got the message, and I I said so john let's just pick up uh what you were talking about in the states you had a uh, oh, yeah. an off the cuff mm -hmm. <laughs> an off the cuff request about an animal not sleeping yes i did I, I, I wasn't expecting this i was on fox tv in uh, new york linked up all around america and there was people ringing in and the guy rang in from Texas uh, saying about the dog said the dog was uh, it was unhappy it was barking all night and so I said well put the dog onto the onto the phone let me have a let me have a word with your dog so just for a, a brief 10 seconds I spoke to the dog quite what the viewers were thinking I'm not sure but anyway <laughs> I got from the dog that they'd moved its box and they'd put its box next to a door that underneath the door, the wind was blowing so that all night the dog was cold. So I, said, I got this from the dog. So I said, listen, all you've done is you've moved the dog's box. It's freezing cold at the night because the wind's blowing through the door. Shift its box back to where you was before. So the dog will be perfectly happy. He said, how did you know I'd moved his box? I said, your dog told me. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, and I think that is... I think this should be a normal, everyday kind of uh, experience for us and that it's not something that we have to say is unusual. I mean, is, is it interesting? I think it's fascinating how, you know, humanity thinks it's pretty evolved, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, humanity has is evolved. I mean, we've evolved We're language. Evolving. <laughs> uh, re revolving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
we've evolved language. I mean, but animals have got language as well. I don't know if you ever listened to Radio 4. They have Tweet of the Day on Radio 4, BBC Radio 4. And the birds are all singing and uh, they're all, they've all got a little message. I did another radio show and uh, I got a call from a guy in uh, Alaska, believe it or not. It was an international radio show. And uh, the guy said to me, he said, uh, everybody says that, that my dog thinks I'm stupid because the dog's looking at me all the time. He says, the dog, he says, does my dog think I'm stupid? So I said, uh, just let me have a word with the dog. So same routine, you know, put the phone to the dog's mouth. I had a word with the dog and uh, he said to me, well, what do you think? I said, well, I'll tell you this. Your dog doesn't think you're stupid, but everybody who's listening to this does. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny anyway, because the dog, the dog had got a sense of humour, but this guy quite hadn't. <laughs> yeah, I like so that. Dog, dog, dogs and animals do have a, a sense of fun as well, obviously, as you know, because they move things around. Yeah. But the thing is, I mean, you'll notice, I mean, people who are going on holiday, you watch what happens when you start to pack bags to go on holiday. Your pets become upset. Mm. You know, they're, they're interacting with you. Where are you going? What's happening? So if you are planning to go on holiday, have a word with your dog or your cat. Oh, Pat, tell... do you want to uh, share your experience about that? John, I think this is quite interesting. Yes. Yeah, well, well, we hadn't had the, our dog rags for, for too long. About a year and a half, we were planning to go down to Cornwall to see friends. Sorry, Pat, can I just say that Rags was also a rescue dog, so... You know. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, he was a rescue dog, and he was lovely. He was um, he was half lab, half collie, so he was incredibly bright, but he had the lovely laid back temperament of a lab, except in situations where he felt separation may be occurring. So, uh, this was, I think, it was the first time we'd ever done this trip, and I suddenly realised he was getting quite anxious and. Um, he kept going into his bed in in the kitchen and sitting in it. And then I suddenly, it suddenly came to me. I thought, I'm going to show him that he is going to come with us. So I took the bed out with his lead and his a bag full of food and put it in the boot of our car. And he immediately jumped into the boot of our car. And I said to him, you're coming with us, Ragsy, but not today. We're, not, we're going off the first thing in the morning. Are you okay with that? And with that, his tail went, ooh, like this. He, he jumped out the car and ran around circles and all this sort of thing, full of excitement. Then he went up to tell Ken he was going on holiday, my ex-husband. <laughs> you know, we're going to, you know, yeah, I'm going to drive there, you know. And, but, and, and he was fine. Doing, yeah. yeah. He was fine with that. So it's just, it's just working out a way that makes sense to them am i coming am i coming am i coming it could have been more obvious yeah you know people just blithely go on you know we do it would tend to this you know oh do this they're busy they're not really thinking they're thinking about the shopping or whatever the poor animals sitting there going what's going on i don't understand it's the same when you move house isn't it yeah exactly the same process you know all these huge what to us is a huge disruption is moving a house, but what is a huge disruption to an animal is you going off on holiday and telling them and not telling them what, what's happening. Yeah, and you that's right. You've got, to, you've got to speak to your pet. I, yeah. You mentioned earlier before that uh, all animals, all creatures have got uh, the ability to communicate, and I believe telepathically. And uh, yeah. It, we go back a few years. I was asked by a television company to to, to test my psychic powers uh, with, with, with animals. So what I did, and it may sound ridiculous, but I got a goldfish in a bowl, yeah? And I, I said, I will get this goldfish to swim to the left of the bowl and yeah. transmitted the thought. And the goldfish went from the middle to the left and stayed on the left. That was a thought that I was transmitting to the goldfish. Yeah. About 20 years ago, I had a big goldfish pond in the back of the garden. And we used to get, a heron that come and eat the goldfish and the, until there was only one goldfish left and do you know that goldfish wouldn't come near the top of the bowl <laughs> now they say that fish have got no memory but that fish had a memory and that yeah. fish knew not to go near the top because if it did 
there was a big bird yeah. coming down to eat it. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Oh, I think they do. And that's an, another of the wonderful uh, videos I've seen is, um, you know, which is showing myriad different interactions with different species. And one of them was a gold, a big one, a big goldfish. But this this chap would put his hand in the, the, the I don't know, his big pond or a lake and every day and this fish would, would come and it would have a little bit of comfort with this guy and it would go off and come back again. So they must have some memory. They In, in the morphogenic field that, that Rupert Sheldrake talks about, which yes. is this overarching field that we all, you know, if, if there's a kernel of a, of a seed of something, let's say, I, I don't know, a plant, that the seed already has within it the morphogenic field of the uh, mature plant. So so it is, I think, with our thoughts and, and what have you. And so I, I completely believe that we are all connected. And not that I know all about that, but I do believe it and keeps finding evidence of it in all kinds of different ways. But I think the animals, as they're so close to us and so much in our domestic environment, really do highlight for us, or can if we allow them, uh, a fantastic, a fantastic connection fantastic relationship and it, it's very enriching you know i know there are people who who don't um, align with animals very much but um, if you do or can find it in you to do the enrichment to life i think is uh, amazing the, really. the, they often term the idea that we uh, apply emotions to animals as being anthropomorphic but I'm absolutely certain that they do have feelings and emotions. Uh, I was telling you earlier about my bulldog grumbles. And uh, when I had grumbles, I used to play rec Elvis records. I quite like, used to like Elvis, you know. So I used to play Elvis and me, and me and the bulldog. And I'd sing along with it. And the bulldog would like make a noise as if it was singing too. So I was doing a show for the BBC called Fully Booked. And it was filmed in Scotland and they invited me up and I said, well, why don't I bring my bulldog? Because I've got an Elvis impersonating bulldog. Really? They said, yeah, bring him, bring the bulldog along. So me and my bulldog went on national television and uh, I'm singing. Uh, I said, does it? I said, oh, yeah, definitely do it. So we got we got on the TV and I'm singing, are you lonesome tonight? And the bulldog, because it was red hot in the studio, the bulldog slavering away, you know, <laughs> and they, and it never sung. And so at the end of it, the producer said it was very funny, but how come the bulldog didn't sing? I said, well, I told you it was an Elvis impersonating bulldog, but I never said it was any good. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, well, they, that. Do, they do make you laugh. I mean, my little doggy, honestly, every day, he's not with us anymore, but every day, he used to make me laugh. Uh, and I can't, I, you know, most humans don't. <laughs> Just because he was so unconditionally lovable and loving, it, it was... Um, uh, and you know that's something that we we miss <laughs> especially in current conditions you know having having that sort of bundle of fur and little feet and funny face to uh you know to say hello to often is uh i i definitely miss that but gosh you know the humor and they definitely do have feelings oh my, my i had my little battersea special dog got um separated from me on a walk unusually never happened before or afterwards and how clever is he um so he managed to find himself through a, a park a main road how he didn't get killed i don't know um you know the dog warden was called everything like that and i had been working nearby at a, at a house and uh, he had gone to this house he'd i'd just taken him to visit that we were working with uh, learning disabled and uh they were you know meeting my doggy because he was so good with folks and he went there and barked, but they didn't recognize him. You know, I didn't take him that often. They just thought he was a stray dog barking. How clever was that? And that was because where I lived had a little gate and he couldn't get down there. But um, afterwards, he was so traumatized by that event because it, that was a huge thing that he did to actually, you know, you know, survive, to be honest. Um, you know, su the suburban roads after the, the woods and everything. And how he got back to the area, I, I have no idea. But I had to uh, treat him with rescue remedy, uh, which is great for shock, and really uh, nurture him. And he was never, you know what, quite the same after that. So animals do have PTSD, big style. And uh, we need to be aware of that sort of thing as well. I don't know if, John, you 
can speak to that or you have any awareness of that sort of thing with uh, no, of course of course uh, animals do have their own feelings they also have a homing instinct they absolutely do know where they live and um, animals you know if if they see somebody that they do not like if there's something wrong about a person they won't go anywhere near them yeah. They, they will they will definitely stay away my little scotty dog that i told you about before who materialized in my hair you know uh my daughter every time she brought a, a young man to the house the dog would go for them you know arr, 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 you know barking at them angry wouldn't let them anywhere near because stop my daughter dulcie was her friend you see yeah. and uh one day she came ac across and brought this young man and the dog ran up and started jumping up and licking his legs and generally befriending him and she married the man oh, you know so, so so we always say that it was the dog that picked the boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I again with my lovely little battersea dog he was really a calm animal you never saw him growl or or anything i mean he might have barked in fun and all that but never he was just very tranquilo and then this one day I was out in the East Sussex countryside about to, you know, try and find a little place for coffee. And he started growling and I couldn't see anybody in my immediate field. And then across the road, a little bit further down was someone who was obviously really drunk. I mean, very drunk. And they'd started, just started as I'd arrived, getting a bit loud. I hadn't noticed initially because my attention was elsewhere, but he was guarding me from this man who looked like he was going to come in our direction and you know we just hightailed it a uh, different direction but that was that was astonishing because never before in his little life had he ever done that and uh sensing, sensing the danger you see yeah i think i think it was you know an out of control drunk human who who was seeing yeah. and there was nobody else around as well so have you have you part of had any experience of animals interacting with the spirit world because i've been uh, a, a psych professional psychic for the last 30 years and my bulldog used to come with me on what i call like ghost hunts ghost busts you know where we go to people's houses who were suffering in fact i did a big feature for the news of the world i've got it here i think there we are. the news Ooh. of the world there we are yeah, that's. You mean yeah. like to do walkies on the other side? Is that? What yeah, you? my my bulldog likes to go walks on the other side. Yeah. Oh, okay. that's interesting. That's interesting. Mm, and uh, we've I found that the if there was an entity in the room, then the bulldog would react to that. Oh, you know, and you oh, and yeah. you could. I, I don't know. Do you do anything any work with discarnate entities, Pat? No, not really. I haven't. I have had animals that have told me that they're connected. Um, like one horse who was connected to the um, the Indian wise elders. So they're connected. I have had instances where they're connected to other dimensions, but I've never had anything that, that you like you've just explained that hasn't sort of come into my field at all. I have one instance where this gentleman uh, asked me to go and help at his house because there was a yeah. negative energy and a presence there. So I went with my bulldog and uh, it was a, the, what it was was the lady who had lived there probably 50 years ago had moved back in as a spirit. Yeah. And yeah. she thought that the people who were in her house were invaders. So I, I could actually see this lady translucently, but I could yeah. see her. And I had a word that said, listen, you do not live here now. You really have to leave the house because yeah. you're causing distress. It was causing uh, the children of the house to become frightened, you know. Yeah. So I had a word with this lady and said, listen, you're going to go. And the, the way I deal with spirits a little bit recalcitrant, I say either you're going to go or I am going to throw you out, you know, like a <laughs> throw somebody out. But anyway, she went. And about two weeks later, the guy contacted me. He says, you and your bulldog did a real job with that, you know. Absolutely, the house is peaceful, the children are happy. He said, but there's a problem. I said, what is the problem? He says, the man next door. He says, he says his house is haunted. <laughs> he moved next door. The lady had gone out and moved in next door. <laughs> but but he, he didn't believe, the guy next door didn't believe it, you see. So yeah. I left him to it, but that's where she was. And it's, uh, absolutely spirits who have not taken the next step 
Yeah, I've had that experience myself. Um, and it was, we had quite a large house at that time. And we were sitting, we'd only just moved in, actually. We were sitting in uh, what we call the front sitting room, which is quite a big Georgian house. And we were sitting there quietly without the television on. And suddenly we heard these very heavy footsteps above. And we both looked at one another to say, you know, if we hadn't both been in the room, I probably would have dismissed it. But I did the same thing. I then went round the house the next day and I went into this room and I said to, I felt it was a woman. I felt it had been a servant in the house previously. And I said to her, I just want you to know that we've come here to uh, make this house, to restore this house back to what it should be. And we're going to take care of it. And I think you need to move on now and leave it up to us. And she did. But there was one further up in the building, up in the flat at the top, who was very persistent. And somebody had told me that they had slept there. A, a local person told me they had slept there one night and they had seen this woman hang herself up there. So once I knew that and I couldn't, the room, it was a labyrinth of rooms and I had to, I found myself unconsciously leaving the door open. I wouldn't let the door slam on my back as it were. Mm. So I propped it open with an old suitcase, I seem to remember. And I walked through the flat and I said the same thing. And I said, I'm sorry for your loss because it was, I think she lost a child or something. I'm sorry for your loss. And, and I said the same thing to her. And what she didn't go immediately, but as I painted each room, she moved to the next room. And then when we got to the last room, I said, you're free to go now. And she did. Oh, that's like, beautiful. Supervising me, you know, is she going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> she was checking out on your progress. Yeah. But what <laughs> I'm lucky to have the ex-neighbour tell, tell me that story because it gave me an insight to what the problem was. Very good. Yeah. Have you any uh, knowledge of the, the history of uh, human interaction with, with, with the animal kingdom and pets? Because the ancient Egyptians used to worship uh, a, a goddess called Bast, B-A-S-T, that was the cat-headed goddess. Oh, really? and, uh, and, and, and they had a, they had a town dedicated to this cat-headed goddess and the cat the, the city was called Bubastis which I believe still exists today in Egypt but they had yeah. temples dedicated to the goddess yeah. Bast and the, it was it was an offense punishable by death to kill a cat and yeah. the, the people that kept the cats if the cat died they used to as a as a, a a sign of, of mourning they used to shave off their eyebrows the, uh -huh. the, the Egyptians yeah. were absolutely devoted to this or to certain yeah. people were devoted to this goddess Bast and to the cats so yeah. historically speaking we go back 4,000 5,000 yeah. years yeah. humanity has recognized the importance of animals yeah, yeah. I think there's there's a lot lot to be said for that and I think that it would be great if we could perhaps hook up again and do another psychic animal uh, chat, because I think there's there's lots to be said about this. And uh, I think it's, it's lovely to, to chat about it in this uh, nice, nice open way. So uh, I'll have to thank you both for today. It's been absolutely great. And I'm going to let you both uh, say uh, thank you very much to Pat and to John. John, can you just give us where the details of uh, any website and where we can get your book well, they can, uh, anybody who wants to speak to me can get me through my website it's called psychicworld.net okay psychicworld.net and uh, uh pat is there any uh, anything that you want to leave by way of contact with people should they want yes, to people with you? Um, have any um uh want information about how i can help them they can get me at uh, pat animal communicator at gmail.co.uk so that's just Pat Animal Communicator, all one word, yeah. at, all lowercase, all lowercase at email. Email. com. Okay, that, that's lovely. All right, folks, well, this is the ET Newsroom, and we would love you to join us again on another psychic animal, and uh, who knows what else we'll get up to in these chats as well. So, John Sutton, thank you very much for your time. Pat, thank you again, absolutely amazing. Yeah.
And I think this is a, a lovely thing to open. Just before I leave, I'm just going to say that also I noted that the super vet, uh, Noel Fitzgerald, is it Fitzgerald? Um, yeah. Is also doing a podcast on yeah, uh, special that. animal, um, I don't know, experiences and things like that. So isn't it interesting that I've just started doing this and then he's just started doing this. But there's something about the awareness of the animal kingdom that is coming up for examination and reevaluation, perhaps. So anyway, this is over and out from uh, ETN, the ET Newsroom, and it's Monday, the 15th of February, 2021. Everybody take care, have a good one, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.